Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. I'm going to ask Father Shearer to come up here and have us all join in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great gift of life which you have bestowed on us once again this day. We thank you for the great gift of Sunday, in which we are able to gather to celebrate your Son's passion, death, and resurrection, in which we are able to unite our lives to your Son's sacrifice for our salvation and the salvation of the world. We ask you to pour forth your blessings upon us, upon our country, upon this world. During this year of faith, we ask you to increase our faith, as we take steps tonight to, to learn more about you, O oh Lord, to learn more about this Mass which we have celebrated earlier today, we ask you to touch our hearts with your grace. We ask you especially to send your grace into the life of little Carlino, that he might be healed, that you might send peace to his family, especially to his poor mother. We entrust ourselves under the patronage of Our Lady of Hope, to your mother, who you have given to be our mother also. And together we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I don't know how many of you were at the lecture series that Deacon Sabatino just completed on Dei Verbum, but one of the things I heard him say was that he's wanting us to see Scripture and look at Scripture with the eyes of the disciples, with the eyes of Christ. This talk tonight is kind of a continuation of that theme, looking with new eyes at the Mass and understanding what a beautiful gift it is that we've been given just that precious patrimony that God has given us from the very beginning. And I'm so glad to welcome back Father Paul Schenk to the Institute of Catholic Culture. I think actually you all know him well and you're wanting to get started, so I'll just ask Father Schenk to come up and please welcome him. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. I notice you have a keen interest in this uh, practical seminar on building an ark. <laughs> I see that you are a uh, brave and courageous lot facing the elements. I began the day at Our Lady of Fatima Shrine in Youngstown, New York, up near Lake Ontario. Uh, where I had the first liturgy of the day at 7 a.m. and then had the second liturgy in my home diocese of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and now this evening with you. So it has been a day in motion highlighted by the wonder, the transcendence, the upward vision of the celebration of Holy Mass, the great thanksgiving, the source and summit of our faith, the true and real presence of our Lord, the sacrament of the altar, this great and glorious expression of God's love to us and our response in love to him. The subject is a daunting one, which is something I have come to expect from Deacon Sabatino. 
he does not assign lightly. Now, I need to give you a warning that uh, when I entered the process, which is called the pastoral provision, which is that very generous direction uh, given to the church through the insights of blessed John Paul II that allowed us who were Anglican clergy to come into full communion in the church and to be ordained to the priesthood. One of the subjects that I was required to study was liturgics. And so I was given a liturgical practicum in my diocese, which lasted for a year, and two graduate courses on liturgics, liturgical theology, at the Graduate School of Theology at Catholic University under Monsignor Kevin Irwin. That was accumulation of six hours of um, graduate credits. These three together were considered an introductory outline (laughs) of the subject matter we approach tonight. So, what can we do (laughs) with this magnificent topic we have been assigned? Well, the best that we can do is to orient ourselves to the font of language, of word and action, which arose through uh, the community of the people of God. So we're, we're going to go backward a bit in time. I'm going to be introducing some terms that you may be totally unfamiliar with, And I will be very glad at the end of the session to uh, answer any questions you might have. It's fine if I'm leaving you in the dust for you to raise your hand and get my attention. And and I'll be glad to explain in the course of the lecture. So usually we hold all the questions till the end. But I think this one really requires allowing questions to be asked in the course of the lecture. Now... A survey of the most ancient forms of the liturgy of the Mass indicates their roots in what I call Temple Judaism. Now, I refer to Temple Judaism. These terms are used in different ways in different contexts, but I hope I will clarify this as I go along, but I use Temple Judaism to distinguish the priestly and sacrificial Judaism of the time of our Lord and the Apostles from the rabbinic Judaism, which was already forming in that period. And these would take two distinct paths so that New Testament scholars today are beginning to speak of the Judaisms of the New Testament period rather than Judaism. Uh, So right now I'm just introducing you to the term Temple Judaism. And if we survey the ancient liturgies of the church, we would find a very close association with Temple Judaism which in the chronology of Judaisms was the immediate predecessor of rabbinic Judaism, which would coalesce and form about 50 years after the destruction of the Second Temple. Now, Temple Judaism was the dominant expression of Judaism in the Holy Lands at the founding of the Church, Now, what I just told you was a tad bit controversial because there are still those who will insist that the earliest forms of rabbinic Judaism were the dominant form among the Am Haaretz, the common people. But I say dominant because without the temple, the priesthood, and the sacrifices, rabbinic Judaism 
itself would have had no orientation to the Holy Land. Rabbinic Judaism, the later form of Judaism, the Judaism without priesthood, without altar, and without sacrifice, arose from the exile in Babylon and from the Galut, the diaspora, outside the Holy Land. So any Jewish life which was oriented to Jerusalem, to Zion, Zion, and to Hakedem, to the holy tradition. Kedem is literally the Hebrew for the East, but it refers to the whole tradition of Judaism. This required a vivid temple cult, or cultus, as the case may be, whichever you like. And so it's my contention that temple Judaism was still the dominant Judaism at the time of our Lord and the apostles in the Holy Land. Now, the structure of the earliest Eucharistic liturgies, and I speak of the liturgies, you'll see why in a little bit, there is only one transcendent liturgy. We use that in a much larger sense, but when we say the liturgies, I'm speaking of the traditions, the uh, form, the language, and so forth. When we look at these, whether they come from the Eastern Church and the Aramaic Chaldean world or communities, or whether they come from the Greek communities, even the later Latin, when we look at these, the period of time of the earliest church, uh, let's say A.D. uh, 32 through the 7th century, 600 A.D., that period of time, we look at these uh, liturgies, they demonstrate a very clear reliance on the well-set forms of Jewish prayers and actions. Now, the liturgy of St. James of Jerusalem which we date to about the first century, of St. Basil the Great, dated somewhere about the fourth century, Uh, the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, a little later, demonstrates the earliest content and forms of the Christian liturgy, or the liturgy of the Eucharist. So they display the most ancient parallels with the Jewish liturgies, and provide a connection to the Jewish sacred literature of the period. Biblical studies has somewhat injured the integral relationship of the literature of this period of time, both Jewish and Christian, by isolating the tradition of the transmission of the scriptures apart from separated from the development of the liturgies. This is, uh, I think, an artificial separation that probably has done a great disservice to both uh, liturgical studies and biblical studies because the two arose side by side, integrated with one another. Now, the traditions, principally now I'm speaking of the liturgical traditions, but we could also speak of a parallel tradition in the transmission of Holy Scripture. Uh, But right now, just speaking of the liturgical traditions, can be traced through the Alexandrian to the Syrian, Antiochian, Aramaic churches of the apostolic and sub-apostolic periods. The liturgies, for instance, of the pre-sanctified gifts dates to the 6th century, The anaphora, now I want to speak about that, and I'm using terms here, and I know you're going to say, how do you spell that? A-N-A-P-H-O-R-A. The anaphora is the part of the text, if you will. It's in linguistic studies. It's a referent which is dependent on a preceding referent, and it's contained in the Holy Mass in what we call the preface to the Eucharistic prayer, and in other elements as well. 
But these ancient texts are consistent across the board, whether we're looking at, as I said, Aramaic, Chaldean, uh, Malabarite, all the Aramaic-speaking churches. These are especially modeled after a set of Jewish prayers we call Barachot. Barachot is the blessings uh, from Baracha to bless, the blessings. These prayers follow a, a certain pattern, which I'll get into in just a moment. Now, the Barachot prayers date uh, from approximately, uh, give or take, uh, 4th century B.C. till uh, the 1st century A.D., but of course we're interested here in the New Testament period, the time of our Lord and the Apostles, and the church and the church fathers, and the fashioning of those early liturgical traditions. The barachot are broken down into subcategories, if you will, or, or broken down a little bit further, to the berchot hamazon, which is the blessing over the food or the bread, and this begins with blessing the name of God. This is kind of the foundation or fountainhead of the Jewish prayers of the time, beginning by blessing the name of God. Another set is the Birchat Haaretz, which is the blessing for the fruits of the land. Blessing God, always blessing God for the fruits of the land. And the interesting thing about the Berchat Haaretz is that this is directly linked to salvation. Now, we like our nice, clean-cut categories. So we have the blessings for food, and we have the blessings for salvation and eternal life. But in these Jewish fountainheads of blessing prayers, blessing God for the fruits of the land is directly linked to and integrated with blessing God for salvation. The food being the portal, if you will, to ultimate salvation. Now, when you think about St. James' admonition to us, if you see your brother in need and you say, be warmed and filled, but you don't attend to his physical need, what have you accomplished? You've accomplished nothing here. Somehow you violated extending to him the invitation to salvation by not attending to his need for food or shelter. And it's very interesting here, the Birchat Haaretz, is the integration of the thanksgiving for the fruit of the land that God gives us and the salvation which he provides. Another of these groups of ancient Jewish prayers is the Birchat HaYerushalayim, uh, the blessings of Jerusalem, which appear as a series of intercessions. We won't go into all the detail on these. They're quite large, and we could spend all evening exploring them. But already we can begin to see some alignments, some uh, echoes as we approach the liturgy of the Eucharist. So into this quintessential Hebrew pattern, in the earliest structures of the liturgy of the Eucharist are inserted the words of institution, and so our Lord's own words are inserted into a structure which reflects these bodies of prayers. So already we recognize that in the Eucharistic prayer as it has come down to us, we already have the structure of the earliest Jewish prayers. Now this in and of itself does not represent a departure or a repudiation of the original Jewish forms, but it plays a role of developing the sacred narrative so that the Eucharistic prayer begins to move from this formal structure of prayers, of blessings, and begins now to incorporate another form of Jewish sacred narrative, and that is the Haggadah, 
Now, this may be familiar to some of you. We've talked about it once before, but if you've gone to a Passover Seder, you know that the book which contains the liturgy of the Passover is called the Haggadah. And this is a word which means the story, the tale. What we have in the earliest Eucharistic liturgies of the church is an integration now of the blessings, the Barachot, and the Haggadah. The two merge together, which was not unusual even in Judaism. In the Jewish tradition, the two intertwine, Haggadah and the Barachot. So we have now a liturgical tradition which will take hold and develop within the church, which integrates these two very important aspects of Jewish liturgical tradition. Now, beginning with the great thanksgiving. This is usually called by the Hebrew, todah. Todah is thanksgiving. And the todah gadol is the great thanksgiving. This was a prayer tradition known in Judaism before the time of our Lord and embodied the whole aspiration or expression of the community in expressing to God gratitude for the whole of his gifts, but most especially for the salvation of the nation, the salvation of the people, the preservation of the community of faith, in this case, of the community of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Israelite community, and later the Jewish community, which was a a derivation of that Israelite community. So the great thanksgiving, the Todah Gadol, was a prayer of gratitude to God for the creation of the world and of mankind. And it proceeds with the praise of God for fullness, for fullness, so that this is gratitude to God for all of his gifts to us, beginning with the creation of the world and of ourselves. And it culminates with a threefold recitation of gratitude to God. Now, this is mirrored in the earliest Christian liturgies of the Eucharist, and in particular of the great thanksgiving prayer in the liturgy of the Eucharist, where there is a recitation of the mysteries of Christ, the proclamation, the confession, and the anticipation of the Lord's return, the second coming, the parousia. And you'll hear echoes of this, of course. You're beginning to think about the form of the Mass, the language, the words of the Mass, embody all of these. This reflects uh, the ancient structure of the Todah Gadol, of the thanksgiving to God. So this then tracks the blessing for the land, or the fruit of the earth, that is the gift of God, the source of sustenance and protection, which comes to us directly from the Berkat Hamazon, which I spoke about a moment ago. Now, when we move into the Eucharistic prayers, we have the language of the which and therefore in the preface to the great prayer of thanksgiving. As I mentioned earlier, we have three different categories of anaphoral traditions that uh, differ slightly theologically from one another. In the first set, the divine name is extolled, as it is in the Jewish tradition. By the time we move to the liturgy of St. Basil, this is clarified and becomes an extolling of the blessed Holy Trinity. So it begins to take on a clearer definition. And in the anaphora of St. Mark, this becomes the word. And this may be reflecting actually a Hellenistic Jewish tradition, which embodied uh, the philosophy of the Memra, uh, which became in Greek the Logos, which of course we know as the Greek term for the word, for Christ, a name of Christ, yes. Mm. You mentioned the Shema, which the question is that I mentioned the Barachot, 
the blessing prayers, but I didn't mention the Shema. The Shema is really in the place of creed, and uh, rather than in the categories of the prayers. It's sort of the brief recitation of the creed. Uh, and of course, our Lord quoted the Shema, so we know it was on his lips, in his heart, and in his mind, as it was all faithful Jewish people of his time. So we have now the divine name, which is not at all to be considered deficient or undeveloped. I'm not suggesting that at all, because the divine name, of course, embodies the whole identity of God. But as we move along in time, the church begins to make this clearer, more precise. So we move then to the Holy Trinity and to the Word. Now, these are reflected in different uh, liturgical traditions in the church at different times, but they are not over against one another. As you can see, there's a progression toward understanding, if you will, the components. You know, there, there's a great deal of mystery that we're embarking upon here. So I, I have a personal aversion to treating the liturgy in a technical fashion like looking at a schematic, because it doesn't work that way at all. It's, uh, the, the, the liturgy is not a schematic diagram. And uh, there's a lot in liturgical study that, you know, you can have fold-out pages with lines drawn to... There's a great deal more mystery. So I like to speak of it less technically and more as an unfolding, a sort of dawning, if you will, a kind of light shed so that when the liturgy begins to clarify the expression of prayer, the theology and the Christology and the pneumatology that comes out, the understanding of the aspirations of the people of God in an encounter with the Lord in these prayers, it's like a structure in shadows, and light is being intensified on that. It doesn't change or contradict anything that's there. It's been there all along. It's always been there, and it's consistent. It's the same. But as you intensify the light, what happens? You see more of it, more of the detail. You see more of the contours. You, you begin to understand more of what is there. Are you following me? Is this useful? This is the way I think the development of liturgy is, uh, like light intensifying. A lot of biblical liturgical study points to the book of Revelation, to the apocalypse, uh, which is perfectly suitable and completely fine to do. I, I, I don't quibble with that one yud. Uh, but, um, but I think we oftentimes neglect the book of Hebrews. When you're reflecting on the liturgy of the Holy Eucharist and its form and structure, oh, I highly recommend that you sit down with the book of Hebrews, which gives such a beautiful backdrop and depth to the aspirations of the church in its highest form of prayer. Now, there is another parallel when we look at elements of the Eucharistic liturgy in the Sanctus, which recalls another group of prayers in Judaism, which are called the Kedusha. From the Hebrew Kadosh, which means holy, these are the exclamations of God's holiness. Um, and they, in the plural, Kadoshot, Kadoshot, are a special blessing of God, which is threefold, and is usually, not always, but more often, a blessing with the wine. So the Kedusha is the prayer which you say on a Sabbath Eve, on a holy day, at a Brit Milah, at a circumcision, at a naming ceremony, a marriage. The Kedusha is said over or with wine. Now, I always say, you know, we see a Kiddush cup. Shorthand is a Kiddush cup. Kedusha, Kedushot, Kiddush cup. We have a Kiddush cup on Sabbath Eve, or as I say, at a wedding. The Kedusha is the blessing over the wine. It's always a blessing of God in the presence of the wine. The wine takes on a, a sacramental quality. 
the Kiddush cup becomes, as it were, the instrument upon which is played the blessing of God. These are all blessings of God. Not the blessing of the object, but the blessing of God in the presence of the object. The object becomes the instrument to bless God. And this blessing consecrates the festival. It sets it apart in a particular way through ritual. And that ritual is expressed in the Kiddush prayer. This, then, is a preparation. In the early liturgy of the Eucharist, this becomes a preceding part to the sanctification of the gifts and the preparation for the consecration. Once we have the epiclesis, as we pray for the Holy Spirit to come down upon the bread and the wine at that moment. But preceding that, of course, is the offertory when we say the blessing for the bread and the wine. We now have the Mass in Hebrew. Well, we've had the Mass in Hebrew for a a long time, but it was only said in the Holy Land. Uh, The Franciscans had it, and uh, it was not permitted to be said outside the Holy Land, but now may be because of the number of Hebrew-speaking Catholics all around the world now. That has now been permitted for the prayer to be said. When we have the offertory prayer, we say, with the bread, Baruch HaTadonai Eloheinu Melech Olam HaMotzei Lecha Min Haaretz. This is exactly the same language, precisely the same language, that I grew up with on Sabbath eves and holy days. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who gives us bread from the earth. Uh, this is precisely the same prayer. Uh, with the wine, Baruch HaTadonai Eloheinu Melech Olam, we have the very same language as the Kiddush prayers in the Hebrew Mass. So here, the correlation is precise, is is exactly what the prayer would be in Judaism. This is a very ancient prayer. We found it in the Dead Sea Scrolls. This prayer is exceedingly ancient, and so it predates any modern or post-Temple Judaisms. And then there is also reminiscence in the form of commemoration. And this strengthens the element of Haggadah, which comes directly from the Passover story, the Passover Seder. Chrysostom, in his tradition, commemorates God's works of creation and salvation. In St. Mark, this is absent. Not quite sure why that is. In the earlier tradition, it is an extolling of God uh, for his salvation of the nation, not precisely reminiscent of the Passover, but in the same spirit. Then we move to another component. This becomes a little more, not exclusively Christian, but again, the light is intensified and the remembrance which comes from the Jewish concept or the Hebrew concept of Zachor. Zachor, uh, you can spell that Z-A-C-H-O-R, is the rehearsal, the recitation, the remembrance of the sacred moment, which translates the prayer, the one praying, into the moment itself. I tell the story of my first remembrance of Passover as a child. I was a young child, not more than seven years old. Uh, And I remember the first Passover Seder. I have a very vivid memory of the rabbi standing. Now, there are always two nights of Passover, one a Seder at home and one a Seder at the synagogue. And I remember the rabbi vividly standing at the end of a bunch of tables, just like these, We were seated at the tables, and I remember the rabbi standing in front of the room and saying, tonight we are slaves in Egypt. And I completely believed that. I I had no doubts at all. I didn't say, oh, now, come on now. That's silly. We're suburban Jews in western New York. Uh, No, tonight we are slaves in Egypt. And it was a mystical moment for me as a young child. We were still in the same precincts. We were still in the same room, still in the same metal folding chairs, still at the same tables, but we were not who we were when we walked in the door. We were now slaves in Egypt. 
And this concept of zahor is to translate the one who is engaged in the zahor to the moment itself. Now, this comes across to us in the recitation or the institution of the Eucharist when our Lord's own words are on the lips of the priest. Now, again, greater light is shed so that we understand it more completely. We understand it more fully. But it is not a repudiation or a contradiction or a denigration of the earlier understanding of it. It's just a fuller understanding of it. When we think of that moment, the consecration, the transubstantiation, we see that this is not a foreign, alien, and utterly unknown concept in the Jewish context, uh, and in particular, in the Passover. Now, I know that this is a controversial topic, but I'm persuaded that the Last Supper was a Seder. Is that okay with you? Um, Well, you're an easy crowd. Uh, Because I could state that somewhere else and and have someone up in arms. Yes. (laughs) That's what I say. You stole my line. Um, No, there are those that say, no, it was not a Seder at all. Some have said that it was a Roman funerary rite. Others say that it was a Greek symposia. And others say that it had elements of all of the above. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm convinced that it was a Seder. But you see here then this tension that exists with the insertion of the words of institution, our Lord's words, and the effect thereof is not an utterly alien and foreign concept in this. Because already the Seder has as its own effect of a sort, a much lesser effect, but nevertheless an effect of transporting those that are rehearsing that Seder into the Passover itself. So it seems to me entirely consistent. In fact, a requirement for our Lord to introduce his own presence and institution into that zahor, into that transposition, into that remembrance, so that the remembrance becomes reality in that moment. And this is not foreign and alien to the Jewish idea of zahor. Is it, is it a fuller understanding of it? Yes. Is it greater light? To be sure. But it is not in conflict with. This is one of the uh, difficulties when we do a comparative study of the liturgies between the emergence of the Christian liturgy and and the Jewish tradition, very often this is looked at as a rupture, a breaking apart, so that one then follows the development of its own unique tradition over against the other. And I don't see such a rupture. Yes, Zachor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Zachor. I'm sorry, what is your name? Yeah. What Anne-Marie was saying was that our Lord was making a parallel with the Passover story. You had the death of the firstborn, but those who had the mark of the blood of the sacrifice were saved, were spared. So those that were seated at table with him and then would pass on the tradition would have understood that. They would have had some understanding of that. It wasn't as if this was a completely foreign, strange idea which Jesus was now uh, foisting upon the Passover. I think I'm enlarging upon what you said. Um, But it wasn't as if our Lord had now taken something entirely unknown and and then foisted it upon the Seder, but took the Seder and brought it to its fullest meaning and their fullest understanding. The disciples present there, of course, would then take that and become the transmitters of that tradition with the light which they now had from our Lord. Some see this also as a tearing away or a rupture, that what our Lord was saying in the Seneca at his Seder was, 
give up and leave behind that old Passover with its lack of meaning and now take my Passover. These are, I think, um, uh, certainly misperceptions, uh, a misunderstanding of what's going on here. Our Lord is taking the tradition already revealed to Israel, already known to the Jewish people, and is shedding greater light on that and bringing it to its fulfillment for them, not exchanging something else for this. Now, I have to, I have to tread very lightly here because the bishops have given us some careful and very good pastoral direction on the representation of this. For instance, uh, you know, when the Seder is celebrated or observed in a church, it should be observed the way in which the Jewish community would observe it and not to impose on it a Christian interpretation. That is not a contradiction to what we're talking about here because, again, as I say, standing alone, the story of the Passover tells the tale of salvation, of the sacrifice of the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We often forget that the Bible, which Jesus and the apostles preached and taught from, was only the Tanakh, the Old Testament. We forget that. But uh, the only Bible they had was the the Jewish Bible. Uh, Now, the same is true, of course, for the liturgical tradition, which, which is integrated with the Bible tradition, with the tradition of the, the text of, of sacred scripture. So the, the Passover standing alone doesn't require us to give a parallel lecture because it, it reflects and embodies uh, the truth, the understanding of which comes upon us as we become believers. I use the example with the Passover I may have told this story to you before, but for those who who didn't hear it, uh, maybe it'll be helpful, and for those who did, uh, you'll be sympathetic. Uh, But um, in the old days, when we used to pick up hitchhikers, my wife and I uh, were driving along. We saw some kids hitchhiking. They looked safe. We pulled over, found that they were students from Chicago, and uh, they were wanting to make their way back to school. We got them in the car, offered to take them where they were going, and uh, realized that we had a captive audience. So uh, we began to share our faith with them. And uh, one student who was Jewish in the back seat said, "Uh, wait a minute, wait a minute, I I don't understand this at all. Why would he have to die for us, for our sins? I, I don't get that at all. And so I said to him, well, just think back for a moment to the Passover, to the Seder, to the Haggadah, to the story. And I, as I began to just bring these little memories up, before I knew it, he said, oh, oh, I get it. Okay, I understand it now. I understand it now. Uh, he saw in the Passover, uh, he would later write a note letting us know that he had been baptized. Um, but see, the Seder holds this truth, but it has to be, the light has to come on it. So we're going to have to wrap this up for a break here. We've only touched on about two and a half of six pages of notes. So, uh, so th- this, again, is just a clause. If my work was an introductory outline, then this is a clause. <laughs> uh, but just to give you a sense of the correlation between these Jewish traditions present at the time of our Lord and the Apostles and echoed, brought out in a fuller meaning, as we celebrate the liturgy of the Eucharist. So we're going to take a quick yes. break. Now, or Thank a you break. so much, Father. A break. Some very good points were made during the break that I think are good and helpful to us, but one that I, I wanted to draw out a little bit is this concern that I sense you have, and I definitely have, about the misrepresentation of the rupture or the break between the church and the synagogue, or the Jewish community and the early church. It is so often referenced back to the theological, or specifically the Christological elements in the worship, so that it becomes a war of worship, and therefore a war of liturgies. And this is not at all the case, historically. The rupture, the the break 
the divorce between the Jewish community and the church really occurred after the rebellion of Bar Kokhba in the early second century. Bar Kokhba attempted to raise an insurrection against Roman domination and to raise an army like the Maccabees against Rome so that he would replicate what Judah the Maccabee did against the Syrian despot Antiochus, Bar Kokhba would do against Rome. The supporters, that there was a, a vast attempt to rally support to Bar Kokhba for the insurrection, and those who, who were attempting to solicit that support, this is, uh, what, early 2nd century, 120, something like that, they're reaching out to Jewish Christians as well as non-Christian Jews in the Holy Land, but the supporters of Bar Kokhba called him Hamashiach, the Messiah. Now, that in and of itself was not a blasphemy, because uh, in a kind of popular understanding in Judaism, the Mashiach was the guy who was going to save us. And so Bar Kokhba was going to raise a, an insurrection, a rebellion, that was going to throw off the yoke of Rome, So he was going to save the nation. So they called him Messiah. But the Jewish Christians could not do that. They could not follow Bar Kokhba HaMashiach, Bar Kokhba the Messiah. They couldn't do that. They also remembered our Lord's words in the gospel that when you see these things happen, flee to the north. Remember this? Take your babes in arms and and go north. And they did. And so the Jews that were left to battle against Rome, this kind of quixotic attempt to throw off this massive power, they branded the Jewish Christians as traitors. Menim. They were traitors uh, because they didn't support the insurrection. They didn't support Bar Kokhba. Instead, they left. And that was really the divorce between the synagogue and the church. Before that, there was great interaction between the Jewish Christians and the non-believing. But so it really wasn't a theological or liturgical break that took place. It was uh, around a political military event that occurred. By that time, the church was overwhelmingly Greek in culture and membership. The majority were now Greek, not only were they Greek Gentiles, but also Greek-speaking Jews. That doesn't mean that there wasn't a Hebrew-speaking church. There was. In fact, I'm going to tell you a little bit tonight about uh, the oldest remnant of Christian liturgy we have in our possession, and it's Hebrew. So there was a Hebrew church, there's no question about it, in Jerusalem, and the bishop always spoke Hebrew. But the majority were Hellenistic in their culture, and that exacerbated the situation. All right, we mentioned the Shema, so I want to go to the Shema for a moment now, um, more than a moment. You'll remember, just to give you a reference point, St. Mark's Gospel, chapter 12, verse 28, when the scribe asked our Lord, which commandment is the first of all? And you remember our Lord answered, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Ve'achavta et Adonai Elohecha, Bechol lev vecha uvechol nev shecha uvechol merdecha. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. I wish I could bring you back into my mind when I read the gospel for the very first time, and Jesus is quoting what I learned in Hebrew school as a bar mitzvah bocher. I, I remember it dawning on me. I was by now in my young teen years, and I remember it dawning on me, so so what's the big deal here? (laughs) This is all very, this is all familiar to me. This wasn't something strange, exotic, uh, dangerous, seditious, you know. This was, uh, oh, this is what this is. (laughs) Now, in quoting the Shema, our Lord quoted the familiar words that are repeated at all Jewish devotions and which were recited daily 
as the most important expression of Jewish faith. Reciting the Shema is, in the Talmud is considered to be accepting the yoke of the kingdom of heaven. And a recognition of the importance of these concepts helps us to understand the placement of creedal professions in the liturgy. Too often, I think, that the recitation of the creed in the Mass is kind of looked on as a sort of memory device, you know, a sort of, okay, let's all get together now and recite why it is we're here. Um, What brought us together? Let's all say together, I believe, and that's not how it was understood. In its Jewish context, when the rabbis say that the recitation of the Shema was to take upon oneself the yoke of the kingdom of heaven, it meant to assume all the responsibilities that arose out of this profession of faith. The word Shema itself is, is very powerful, this term. We translate it here, this Anglo-Saxon, shallow and tawdry tongue. Um, Shema, well, perhaps the best word would be heed. It means to open oneself to the totality of what is being spoken. Go back to the original Shema in uh, Exodus 19 and 20. The mountain is engulfed in dark smoke, peals of thunder, and blinding bolts of lightning. The earth is shaking. Take your sandals off to get a steadier footing. A voice is being heard. The bot call, the echo from heaven, and the commandments are being accused by the finger of God in rock from the mountain. Moses' visage is transformed to something unworldly. And what do the people say? All that the Lord says, we will do. Amen. This is the yoke of heaven. This is taking upon oneself the yoke of heaven, according to the rabbis. Father Raymond Brown, in his commentary, says that the recitation of the Shema in Mark's Gospel means that decades after Christian beginnings, Gentiles were still being taught to pray a Jewish prayer as part of the fundamental demand placed by God. And I think this is an insight. Father Brown can get a little too technical, a little too um, schematic for my taste. But he's on something here, I think, because the Shema comes straight across. And of course, Mark is writing the cliff notes of St. Peter. And he's writing for a Gentile audience. He's writing for Roman citizens, cultural Romans who are bilingual, who speak Greek. And he's writing about Jewish things for them. He's giving them the basic, you know, the RCIA. (laughs) Um, But he finds it absolutely essential to retain our Lord's recitation of the Shema. You know, this isn't just like a curiosity. This isn't a shtiklach, just thrown in. This is essential. So these Roman subjects who live in a Greek environment whose evangelizers are the descendants of Jewish followers of the Messiah, are still being inculcated with the recitation of the Shema. I mean, it's on our Lord's lips. We can't say that this is just a curiosity or an option or antiquarian or something like that. This is an essential component of the church's pedagogy and formation and instruction in prayer. It's not only with the rabbis, though, that the early church shared common theological or prayer tradition, especially in the New Testament. Christianity draws spiritual themes directly from the temple in Jerusalem, central to Jewish faith. The altar, the sanctuary, the sacrifices, the priesthood, Even the precincts and the chambers of the temple contribute important meanings to the Christian revelation. 
according to Rabbi Neusner, who has probably written more and with greater insight than any really modern Jewish thinker in regard to Christianity, Rabbi Neusner points out in his writings, and he has more than 55 published books now, he points out this direct connection and correlation between rabbinical Judaism, the later form, the later Judaism, temple Judaism, and early Christianity. He writes, the catalytic event in the formation of the kind of Judaism we now know as normative, that is, the Judaism that took shape in the documents produced by the rabbis from the first through the seventh centuries, that correlates on the timeline with what I gave you earlier as the development of Christian liturgy, the same period of time, was the destruction of the temple. That same event proved decisive in the formation of Christianity as an autonomous and self-conscious community of Israelite faith. Let me read that to you again, just that phrase. That same event proved decisive in the formation of Christianity as an autonomous and self-conscious community of Israelite faith. Now, that's surprising to hear a rabbi, and a modern one at that, a great scholar, new, new Orthodox rabbi, write something like that. But it shouldn't surprise us at all. After all, how many times are you called Israel in the liturgies, right? How many times are you called Israel? Or do you call yourself Israel? Rabbinical Judaism survived the destruction of the temple as the universal expression of non-Christian Israelite religion. And yet the Judaism in the New Testament was quite varied and included a variety of beliefs and practices that later, after the destruction of the temple, uh, if you need to put a date on that, approximately 70 AD, 72 in that period of time, after the destruction of the temple, of course, arose rabbinic Judaism, or what we consider to be Judaism, the predominant Judaism today. So the temple gave to us and gave to our Lord, or our Lord gave to the temple, as it were, the Christian revelation. And notice how much of our Lord's ministry is related to the temple. Just, just think about that for a moment. When you think of some of the most important events in our Lord's life, they're connected to the temple, aren't they? We have the prayers in the temple, the Benedictus, right? Priest of the temple. We have our Lord making his bar mitzvah. Where? In the temple, right? We have our Lord overturning the tables of the money changers. Where? In the temple. Our Lord is apprehended and tried. Where? In the shadow of the temple in the temple precincts. This isn't accidental. What is happening here is that the temple will dissolve itself into our Lord's revelation of himself. The temple will be caught up into the revelation of Christ. The temple is not tossed out as if we were to say, oh, that old thing, you don't need that now. You've got something brand new and shiny. Just get rid of that. By the way, did anybody go and visit the Dead Sea Scrolls exhibition at the Franklin Institute? Were you there? Go, and, and there's a big stone from the Second Temple in Jerusalem. It would be the temple that was the backdrop for our Lord, the apostles and the, the Holy Family, and, and the scenes in the Gospel. And there was a stone. Put your hands on it. Touch it. Embrace it. I have a photo of my hands on it. They believe it fell from the top into a ravine and situated itself such that it just stayed in place until a recent archaeological excavation there, and they were able to take this very large stone. It's about four times the size of this podium. And there you just put your hands on a piece of stone that our Lord's eyes in Jerusalem and, our, and the apostles and they witnessed that stone, looked at that stone. It, was, it couldn't have been uh, disguised. <laughs> so it wasn't a matter of taking the temple and its priesthood and its sacrifices and just tossing them into the trash heap and saying, now you've got something all new, different, and unlike that, and you don't need that old stuff anymore. No. What did our Lord call his own body? The temple, didn't he? What does St. Paul tell us we are? The temple. We're the holy temple. The temple itself is taken up into Christ. Now, this is where we need the writer of Hebrews. Boy, you read Hebrews in light of this. 
Because the writer of Hebrews, in the main, is telling us the meaning of the temple, is intensifying that light, turning up that light on something known to all the Jews. Now you say, well, really, was the temple in Jerusalem uh, that important to the Jews in exile in the diaspora? Was it that important to the Jews of Alexandria who were readers of Philos? And uh, was it really that important? They built a temple in Alexandria. That's how much they needed one. They built a temple in Aksum in Ethiopia. Uh, They never gained the status of the Holy Temple in Jerusalem. They couldn't. The Jerusalem temple was unique. But they tried to approximate it because in order to be Jews, they needed the temple. Uh, But then the temple would fall, 70 AD, and never be constructed again. And suggest in Israel today that the temple be rebuilt and you will be run out on a rail by Israelis. (laughs) Don't even suggest it. It's out of the question. Nobody's ever going to rebuild the temple. The state of Israel would never permit it. The, The Orthodox wouldn't build it. There is a temple institute building the furniture of the temple now for the new temple. If you ask to go there, I've been there. It's quite beautiful. They're built to scale and There's a menorah made of gold, real, I mean, gold all the way through, but they're looked at as crazies. They're Meshuggah, you you don't want to, you wouldn't go over there. The point is, the temple's not going to be rebuilt. Not now, not here. So the temple goes in 70 AD. Really, the temple went before that. The temple really was a shell of of itself in 70 AD. It had just been ravaged politically, militaristically. It had just been really rabid. It was the tensions and the strife inside the temple. The Talmud says, if you're walking down the road and the Hakoin Hagadol, the high priest, is coming at you, step over to the other side of the street so you won't be defiled by him. Um, there's a whole piece, there's a whole tractate in the Talmud <laughs> that just derides the high priest, even pointing out that he didn't speak Hebrew. He didn't know how he had to be helped with Hebrew. So it really was just a shadow of itself in 70 AD. In 70 AD, the temple goes never to be rebuilt again, and it's still in ruins today, even with a Jewish state overseeing it. That just points up, it doesn't prove, but it points up that the temple has been incorporated into the revelation of Christ. And so really read the book of Hebrews with this perspective. Look into the book of Hebrews and see there how it says that, oh, we were talking about schematics. There is a reference to a schematic in the letter to the Hebrews in which it says that the blueprint, the floor plan of the holy temple came to us from heaven. It is a copy. It is a schematic of floor plan of the heavenly. That's what the writer of Hebrews says the temple was. Well, if that's true, can we see then how the temple And its meaning, its inner meaning, its mystical meaning is all caught up into Christ. So we can't go into all of this. All right, so the one thing then that I'd like to uh, just uh, bring about or uh, bring us to as we close is the concept of the Shekhinah. The Shekhinah, you can spell it S-H-E-K-I-N-A-H unless you want to say it in Aramaic, Shechinta, and then spell it similarly and put a T-A on the end of it, okay? S-H-E-K-I-N-A-H, transliterated, the Shechinah. The Shechinah is actually a verb meaning to abide, to rest upon or rest in, and, but it came in later Judaism, the later Judaism of the post-temple period, it came to be used as a noun, to refer to God's presence. But this was not a novelty. It was derived directly from sacred revelation and and sacred scripture. The Shekinah abode, it dwelt, God's presence, in the sanctuary of what was first called, well, we call it the tabernacle. And that comes from the Vulgate. In the tabernacle, in Hebrew, we call it the Mishchan, Mishchan, Shechinah, Shechin, Mishchan. 
Mishkan, which we have brought over as, in some modern translations, tent of meeting. That's kind of a easy Americanism. Or tabernacle. But Mishkan means from the presence. From the presence. From the dwelling. That's what it literally means in the Hebrew Bible. God's presence in the midst of his people, his real presence in their midst, in the Holy of Holies, which was that inner sanctum of the sanctuary, the holy place. And the Shekhinah dwelt upon the koporo, the mercy seat. These are words that later were interpretations. God in the midst of his people. And uh, the Shekhinah is first used in the Old Testament in Exodus 25, 8. That's one scripture you need to know where God directs that a dwelling place or an abode, uh, the Mishkan, should be built, and he says that I may dwell in their midst. In Numbers 9.22, the same word is used specifically to refer to the glory cloud, which was God's abiding presence over Israel. When the glory cloud was over the tabernacle, the people knew that God was with them. God is with us when the glory cloud was over the tabernacle that contained the altar, the Ark of the Covenant, and that illustration, the mercy seat. Now, the word itself describes what the cloud of God's presence does, but it also refers to God's special presence, and so uh, became a noun, the Shekhinah. Solomon offers to build God an exalted house. You remember this? A place for you to dwell in, he says to God in 1 Kings chapter 8. I had a teacher in public school that made us memorize this whole portion of Kings. Never mind, it's another story. (laughs) Um, So the divine presence abode in Israel on the mercy seat. Now, the mercy seat was gone by the time of our Lord and the apostles, because the mercy seat, of course, was that throne that sat on top of the Ark of the Covenant, Ha'aron Habarit, the Ark of the, the Holy Ark, the Holy Ark of the Covenant. So it was gone, and therefore the divine presence was gone. The Talmud has rabbis bemoaning the absence of the Shekhinah in the temple at the time of the New Testament of our Lord. But that divine presence abode above the mercy seat between the two cherubim that are upon the Ark of the Testimony. This is key to understanding how the temple is fulfilled in our Lord. We can't go into the depths of the details of this, but I want to bring it back very quickly. This Shekhinah, this abiding, it signifies something more than localized presence. In the biblical context, it refers to God's essential presence upon, with, and within the midst of his people. It is not aloof and far off, but abides with them, dwells in their midst, among them. And John's gospel tells us that the promise, this promise of God's abiding presence with his people, was really and truly fulfilled in Christ When John says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And then now bring us back to the Mass, to the Holy Liturgy, to the Eucharist, where Jesus tells us how it is he truly abides with us in our midst and in us when he says, this is is my body given for you. This is my body. Now the church teaches us that in his Eucharistic presence, our Lord remains mysteriously in our midst as the one who loved us and gave himself up for us, and he remains under signs that express and communicate this love. Presence The Shekinah, the presence in the temple, at the mercy seat, in the ark, in the tabernacle, in the temple, was fulfilled in our Lord giving himself to us in the sacrament of the altar, in his real and true presence in the Holy Eucharist. And so we've only touched on tonight. We've just touched on some of these themes, far, far less than 
an outline of an introduction. Just a little bit here to sort of whet your appetite to explore these things further. So I recommend to you a reading of the book of Hebrews in light of all that I've, I've given to you tonight. There's so much more that we could have done, and I've given you more uh, than what I did in the lecture in this little booklet. So we'll finish up now. Do we have any time for are a you, Q&A? Are, are you willing? You've had such a long day. Um, I, I, I am willing. I can't <laughs> tell you that what, what I will say is, uh, <laughs> you know. Thank you so much, Father Shank. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Father. You spoke about the beer cut, forgive my Hebrew, it's absolutely horrible. The, the beer cut ha mazon. Ha mazon. There we go, praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> these Jewish prayers of blessing. Hashem. And obviously in our minds, a strong resemblance to our offertory prayers. But of course, as I understand, the offertory prayers of our ordinary form mass are taken from the Jewish prayers. If you mm. could connect them to the offertory prayers from the extraordinary form, which I don't quite see the resemblance between the two. There is further development in the extraordinary form. In, in the later Latin Mass, as it developed, but if you look at those prayers, there are additional prayers that do not directly derive from this tradition. There is language which is reminiscent. Sometimes, because of its development, it becomes a lot more words and, and phrases and so forth, but you'll still find there echoes, reminiscences, if you will. Not always, because there were prayers that were introduced later down the line, which are perfectly, obviously, valid, and, and they're not to be questioned. But again, not contradictory. In fact, if you look at, read the Extraordinary Form, uh, there are some that are very, very close in language and expression and just force um, of aspiration. They're very close to Jewish prayers, and of course, especially the ones that echo the Psalms, which is... As the, as the Psalter has been called the prayer book of the church, the prayer book in the Bible, it is definitely so in Judaism. But I, I can't go much further because I'm, I'm no expert on the extraordinary form of the math. As we talked about previously with the Last Supper being the Seder, could you talk about within the context of Christ and the three cups of wine versus the four required for Passover because he is the Passover? He's asking in regard to the Last Supper being a, a Seder and the three cups of wine as opposed to the four cups of wine, and the fourth that Jesus seems to not have used. The fourth cup of wine was the unfulfilled anticipation of the coming of the Messiah. The fourth cup, the cup of redemption, it's not mentioned in the gospel account of the Seder. In that, many see Jesus not elevating that cup because he is making a statement that the cup is now fulfilled. The meaning of the cup is fulfilled, yeah. We have the liturgy of St. John of Chrysostom. Yeah. I assume he put together the liturgy. I'd like to know who put together the Roman rite. The liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, as I understand it, uh, and I'm no scholar or expert on the Greek liturgies, but these are ascribed to, in this case, St. John Chrysostom, but his name is given to a course of tradition that gave rise to that. As to the Latin, again, it's an evolutionary process. It's evolving from a course of tradition. And Father, do we, we don't ascribe, we don't say that St. John Chrysostom de Novo sat down and wrote the liturgy. It's a context of traditions. I have a question, Father, from online, an online viewer. Mm -hmm. When you were talking about modern day Jews, um, why wouldn't they want the temple rebuilt? This is from Daria Vilhauer. But if you could just briefly address that, and then I'll go to Randy here. All right. There are several reasons. I don't know of a Jewish answer that contains only one reason. Um, but so there are several. If we go back to the strict interpretation of Orthodox Judaism, they would say that the temple can only be reconstructed by the Messiah. So we would not dare to ourselves uh, begin something which is exclusively for the Messiah to build. That's one. Another reason is that the temple itself is, and I don't want to overstate this, but is against rabbinic Judaism as it's defined and practiced. 
the sacrifices have been replaced or superseded by mitzvahs, by doing good. And the priesthood is replaced by the rabbinical teaching authority and the study of Torah. There isn't a place in rabbinic Judaism as it is defined and known and experienced and practiced for the altar, the sacrifices, and the priesthood. And then the third reason is a political reality, that to suggest the construction of the temple would be to potentially set off a religious war that neither the Jewish state nor the Jewish people would want. Father, on this subject of the Seder meal, I once uh, read it expressed that the importance of the Seder meal for Jewish understanding is that is where the young person, uh, it's the mystical way in which they enter into Judaism. And in the same way, or a similar way perhaps, as the Jewish person enters Judaism through the Seder, Catholics enter Catholicism through the Mass. And so when Jesus says, do this in memory of me, I understand that the language is drawn from the Haganah, which says, you know, you're doing this in memory of something that went before, the coming out of Egypt. And so our Lord realizes he's going to be leaving, going to heaven, but this is how he's setting up a similar pattern. Could you comment? Well, I think you're right on to it, and that's what I meant to say when I said that um, it's a translation of the person participating in the Passover actually is transported, or, or more than that, translated into the context and now becomes the actor in the Passover. But there's an interesting teaching that the Passover is eternal because it is always the beginning of months. And, you know, there's this big uh, debate over what was the beginning of the Jewish year? Was it the civil year or was it the religious year? And that all comes from the definition in Holy Scripture that the Passover is the beginning of months. And of course, the term beginning itself comes from that first phrase in Genesis. So the Passover transcends time. It can't be locked in chronologically. It's eternal. The Passover is eternal. And this, of course, now as you, know, you were observing, I don't know who it was who said that the Catholic enters into his or her faith through the Mass. I get an understanding of what's being conveyed there, but we can also see meaning now in our Lord entering into and bringing his apostles into instituting the priesthood in the Passover. If the understanding is the Passover is eternal, that doesn't mean interminable, it transcends time. It's out of the confines of time. So when we enter into the Holy Mass, when we're celebrating the liturgy, we're transported out of the confines of our contemporary situation. We're transported, translated out of that. We're entering into a mystery which is eternal, unbounded by time and space. We could take the next 14 weeks on that. <laughs> we'll have to invite you back once we're doing semester-long right. courses. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, Father, again. I'm a little weary. <laughs> Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.